Greetings and welcome to Word Magazine. This is Jeff Riddle. I'm the pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. In this episode of Word Magazine, we're going to be looking at the announcement that just came out yesterday, anticipating 200 plus changes that will uh, take place in the next uh, printed editions of the modern critical Greek New Testament handbook. And this news uh, sort of came out yesterday. Uh, I saw a tweet on Twitter about a conference, a Bible translation conference that was held in Dallas, Texas. And one of the persons who was there attending the conference reported on a plenary address or a lecture given by one of the speakers in which he was giving a preview for the changes that are coming to the modern critical Greek text uh, when apparently the Nessel Alon 29th edition will be published in 2024, and then the corresponding United Bible Society 6th edition in 2025. And so in this episode, I want to talk a little bit more about this announcement as uh, it was reported on Twitter slash X, whatever you want to call it. And maybe a good place to start would be uh, just pulling up uh, that tweet. Um, so on, on my Twitter, I saw this announcement from this fellow named Drew Mouse. I don't personally know him, but he is a Bible translation consultant uh, for Wycliffe. And in uh, his tweet, he mentioned uh, this lecture that was held at this Bible translation conference. Let me just see if I can make that picture a little bit larger. And there you can see the lecture. There you can see his PowerPoint. And Drew Maust uh, reported in the tweet, in his NIDA lecture at the Bible translation conference 2023, Edgar Bojo, um, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. I hope that's somewhere close to being correct. It could be Aboyo, I guess, but I'm going to say Abojo. Edgar Abojo is forewarning Bible translation practitioners of 200 plus changes to Matthew, Mark, Acts, and Revelation coming in the next edition of the Greek New Testament in 2024-2025. And if you enlarge the screen there, you can see uh, Mr. Abojo giving his lecture. And then there at the top, you can see N.A., that's Nestle Aland, the Novum Testamentum Graeke, 29th edition in 2024, and the UBS, United Bible Society's Greek New Testament, which will be in its sixth edition in 2025. And then he reports... Uh, two, over 200 uh, uh, changes that will be made. And he says in Acts, Mark, uh, Matthew, and in Revelation. And uh, I was wondering why he didn't put those in canonical order, why he, he didn't say Matthew, Mark, um, Acts, and Revelation. And maybe that's because uh, he's taking notice in that, that Acts and Mark have already been published in what is known as the ECM, the Editio Critica Maior, which is a major revision of the modern critical text. And maybe the ordering here indicates that Matthew will soon be published, and so will uh, the book of Revelation. And so uh, I tweeted that out, and it seems like it has gotten a little bit of uh, traction as other people have liked it, shared it, and it's been talked about, discussed, and at least one person had asked if I would do a follow-up to this and explain a little bit more about what the significance is and the background is to these 200 changes that are coming in the next edition, scholarly editions of the Greek uh, handbook of the New Testament. And so I thought maybe we'd go back and uh, look for a second at this conference. And I, I looked online and I wasn't aware of this conference till I saw the tweet about it, but there is this Bible translation conference 
and it was held October 13 through 17 in Dallas, Texas. Now, the tweet was yesterday, so I assume that Abojo's lecture was yesterday, October the 17th. Today is, is Wednesday, October 18, 2023, but this conference was held there, and if you go down to the bottom of the website page, it says, uh, about the Bible Translation Conference, the biennial Bible Translation Conference is dedicated to advancing the theory and practice of Bible translation. It is sponsored by the Dallas International University and SIL International. I didn't know what that was. I looked it up and I found uh, a website for SIL International, but I, I, even on the about page, it, I didn't see any explanation for. I looked it up on Wikipedia, and apparently SIL stands for uh, Summer Institute of Linguistics. So it's some kind of evangelical organization. Looks like it was founded in the 1930s that's devoted to linguistics and Bible translation and missions. And then it, uh, also this meeting was hosted uh, by the NIDA or the NIDA Lecture was sponsored by the NIDA Institute at the American Bible Society. So uh, this conference held every two years, and this is where uh, Mr. Abojo was giving the NIDA lecture, and so the tweet was related to that. Let me see if I can uh, also pull up, if I can, some information about the lecture. There we go, about the lecture series. And apparently they had have a couple of lectures at this biennial uh, conference where there it looks like there are people from all over the world who are involved in Bible translation come. There's the Beekman lecture series. And the one we're interested in is this one, the NIDA lecture series. And the name for this comes from Eugene A. NIDA. And if you look at his Wikipedia page, uh, he lived from 1914 to 2011. And he was an American linguist who developed the dynamic equivalence Bible translation theory. So if you read or if you're, you're familiar with the new international version that follows a translation philosophy that's based on uh, translating the text in a thought by thought manner rather than a word by word manner, that's dynamic equivalence and it's entered into the mainstream of most modern translations in various languages follow, at least to some degree, this dynamic equivalence um, uh, method. And so Eugene Nida was the was an innovator in that. And so we can uh, look at the the description of this year's lecture. The 2023 lecturer is Dr. Edgar Abojo, and um, there's a description of him. There's a picture of him. It says, Reverend Edgar Batad Abojo, again, apologies if I'm mispronouncing the name, PhD, University of Birmingham, UK. And if you're familiar with modern textual criticism, you know the University of Birmingham is uh, one of the leading academic centers for the digitization of the biblical text and the study of it. And um, D.C. Parker, David C. Parker, now retired, was there, had a huge influence uh, in modern textual criticism, uh, arguing against traditional views of looking for the original text and saying that there are many texts and all of them are of equal importance. And despite uh, the protestations of some like Peter Gurry, uh, he has had a huge influence in modern textual criticism. And so Dr. Abojo uh, is someone uh, who probably studied, if not under Parker, at least was influenced by him at University of Bir Birmingham. It says of him, he is one of the global translation advisors of the United Bible Societies, the so-called UBS. Aside from translation projects in Asia Pacific, he is currently the UBS or United Bible Society member to the editorial committee of the UBS Greek New Testament 6th edition, UBS 6, and the Nestle Alan Novum Testamentum Graeke 29th edition, or the NA29. Um, and so you may or may not know that uh, these are the two standard 
scholarly textbooks, of handbooks of the Greek New Testament. Uh, the Nessel Aland uh, came from Eberhard Nessel, who started his uh, Novum Testamentum Graeke in 1898, and now it's on its 28th edition, apparently soon to be a 29th edition. And then um, it is the same text as in the United Bible Societies. The difference between these two editions is that they have a different apparatus in each one of them. And so this is interesting because this, this fellow, Dr. Abojo, is you know, one of the gatekeepers. He is on this elite committee of a handful of people who are, who are making the final decisions about the Greek New Testament, the scholarly text that will be used in Bible colleges and seminaries, that will be a basis for translations of the Bible into various languages. And it also says of him, he also serves as a committee member of the International Greek New Testament Project, the IGNTP, the scholarly body tasked to prepare and produce the Editio Critica Maior, or the ECM of the Greek New Testament. Um, and so again, um, you should be aware of the fact that there is a major revision that is underway of the modern critical Greek New Testament. It started uh, some time back. It's called the ECM, the Editio Critica Maior. Um, and this, this uh, edition uses a new method that was developed by a German scholar named Gerd Mink, and it's known as the coherence-based genealogical method, or the CBGM. And it is a computer program that uses a computer algorithm to compare readings in extant Greek manuscripts. And so piece by piece, it's being applied to the New Testament, sort of book by book. And so in 2012, in the Nestle on 28th edition, the most recent edition of the scholarly handbook, and the UBS 5th edition, it was applied just though to the, the so-called general or Catholic epistles, meaning the book of James and 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd, 3rd John, and Jude, those seven books. And now it's being applied apparently to Matthew, Mark, Acts, and Revelation, and the ECM which come out as printed editions and also online editions, this will now, this information will be incorporated into these handbooks, again, that are read in seminaries, Bible colleges, universities, and also are used as a basis for translations. It also says of him, he is an ordained minister of the Bethel Pentecostal Church and served as a pastor for Filipino churches in the Philippines, Singapore, and England. Um, I, I looked up Bethel Pentecostal Church, but there are several churches under that name. I'm not, I'm not sure which one he is connected with. And we might say at least he has some kind of Christian identity because heretofore, I haven't really known what the confessional perspective was of the persons uh, on these editorial committees. Uh, were they Lutherans? But even with him being from Bethel Pentecostal Church, what do we know about this? He could be a witness Pentecostal for all we know. Is he an Orthodox Trinitarian Pentecostal? He's certainly not, not confessionally reformed. Um, but anyways, it says he's also married to the former Mrs. Irene Marillo and has a gorgeous son, uh, Dio Nathan L. M. Abajo. And again, I hope I haven't messed up uh, any of those names. So this is the person who was making this announcement in his lecture yesterday. And because he's in this privileged position, this announcement has a lot of weight because he's he's and he's telling us something I didn't know, that that the, the new editions are coming out. 2024, the Nestle on 29th edition, uh, 2025, the UBS uh, sixth edition. There's also posted here uh, an abstract uh, of the presentation that he apparently did yesterday for the NIDA lecture, and it was titled A Blast from the Past, Revisiting the Manuscript Tradition as a Paradigm for Quality in Learning Biblical Languages for Bible Translation. And I'm assuming this is uh, Dr. Abojo here. 
Um, uh, interesting, he's in a Presbyterian church where the ministers apparently wear uh, a clerical collar. Interesting. Um, you can see by the title of this, I don't think his primary purpose was to tell about the NA-29 or the UBS-6. Uh, rather, he probably just mentioned it incidentally. It seemed like the thrust of his talk was about learning biblical languages to be a Bible translator. But in the abstract, it does say, accordingly, it is commonly assumed that to satisfy the rigid requirements of fidelity in translation, appeal to and use of the original biblical languages have to be made as part of our translation process, which in practice actually refers to the critical text editions of Hebrew and Greek Old Testament and Greek New Testament. So this tells us a lot. Uh, he believes that translation should be made on the modern critical text. It's kind of interesting. He says for the Old Testament, not just the Hebrew, but also the Greek, the Septuagint. And so this reflects the inroads with respect to the Old Testament now, not being translated merely from the Masoretic Hebrew text, but being corrected uh, using the Old Greek or Greek translations or the Septuagint, and sometimes even the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Syriac and so forth. So um, this was the, the gentleman who was making the presentation. Actually, um, I went back and remembered that in the Myths and Mistakes book that came out in 2019, Dr. Abojo uh, was also a contributor uh, to this book. I think he did the very last um, article in here. Uh, that's chapter 15 of the Myths and Mistakes book. And it's titled Myths About Modern Translations, Variants, Verdicts, and Versions, Edgar Batad Abojo. And so his expertise is in the area of Bible translation. So... Um, Let's think about this announcement uh, that there's going to be a new edition of the uh, standard scholarly handbook that will be coming out next year in, in 2024. It will be the 29th edition of the Nestle Aland Novum Testamentum Graeke. As I mentioned, the major thing that has happened here in the 21st century has been this new method of textual criticism. And it's interesting because sometimes you'll hear people talking about textual criticism. They're still using the old language of the 20th century. They're talking about text families and they're talking about uh, recovering the autograph and so forth. But in 21st century modern textual criticism, they've abandoned the idea of recovering the authorial autograph. Now they talk about the Ausgangs text or the initial text. So just reconstructing the text maybe as far back as they can. And there's also this sort of postmodern sense of, well, one reading can have its merit and another reading can have equal merit. And we don't have to choose one or the other in the ECM printed edition uh, of the Gospel of Mark, for example. They had a number of what were called uh, split guide uh, readings where you could choose one or the other. And so there's, there's very much this sort of postmodern sense of, we're not attempting to reconstruct the autograph. We can't do that. They, they acknowledge, given the, the empirical evidence, there's not enough evidence authoritatively to reconstruct the text. And what is more, they said, it's not that's not a valid goal. Instead, we should look at the textual transmission evidence as a window into early Christianity. And there can be one text that could have been authoritative for one community and another text that was authoritative for another community. D.C. Parker even says there may come a day when we can all create our own Bibles. So you may go into church and it's not a matter of, you know, one person has the KJV, one person has the NIV, one person has the ESV, one person has the Living Bible. It's that everybody has their own Bible. And although uh, some folk like Parker might see this as a wonderful development, as I pointed out, I think this would be horrendous for the church if there's not a uniform, standard, stable uh, text of the Bible that, that can be used by God's people. And so, uh, again, as I said, this uh, Editio Critica Maior has been a big academic project. And uh, apparently, like the Gospel of John has been given to some people at the University of Birmingham to work on that. 
Uh, the Institute in Munster is, is working on other editions. And uh, they have already published, indeed, uh, the ECM volumes on uh, the Book of Acts and the Gospel of Mark. Those have come out in a hard uh, uh, format, uh, book format, and they're also available online. And now, apparently, soon, Matthew and Revelation uh, will be coming out. And again, what they're using is this so-called coherence-based genealogical method, or CBGM. I actually did a um, an article about CBGM just a couple of years ago. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. No, let's just get rid of that. Let's get, there it is. Um, if you're interested in learning more, this was came out in the April, June, 2021 issue of the quarterly record of the Trinitarian Bible Society. This is from my academia.edu page. You can visit that, find a link at my blog at jeffriddle.net and then go to the academia.edu page, look under articles and you'll see it. And uh, so I did a, just a, a simple sort of popular level introduction to the CBGM and I called it the newest new method. And again, what this is about is using a computer program, using a computer algorithm to compare existing readings from extant Greek manuscripts. As I point out in my little article about the CBGM, this method does not use the citations from the church fathers, which often support traditional readings, like the traditional ending of the Gospel of Mark. It does not include uh, information from ancient translations and versions uh, like the Old Latin, for example, that often also support uh, traditional readings. Uh, but it, it is supposed to focus just on the Greek manuscript um, editions. And so again, this is being applied. And as I pointed out, uh, it's already been applied in the Nestle Alon 28th edition to the so-called general epistles or Catholic epistles. So when this came out in 2012, uh, there's, uh, there's an introduction that provides uh, information about this particular edition. And on pages 50 and 51 of the introduction, if you have it, you know there's a German introduction, then there's an English translation of it, and the pagination for the English translation, they just put an asterisk by it. But on pages 50 and 51, or 50 asterisk and 51 asterisk, uh, they uh, point out the changes that they made from the 27th edition of the Nesselon to the 28th edition. And they list there some uh, 33 changes that were made. There were five changes made in James, eight in 1 Peter, 10 in 2 Peter, four in 1 John, two in 2 John, one in 3 John, and three in the book of Jude for a total of 33. So 33 changes were made based on the CBGM and analysis of it from the 27th edition of the Novum Testamentum Graecae uh, from uh, Nestle and Elan to the 28th edition. And indeed, uh, some of these changes are, you could consider them minor. They might, they might involve things that are matters of spelling, and they might not be significant or they might not show up in a translation. Of course, we believe, though, because we believe in plenary, full verbal inspiration, we believe that every word is valuable. And so there are no insignificant variants. As Christ said in Matthew 5, 18, uh, he promised to, to preserve his word so that not one jot or one tittle would be lost. But when you look at these, many of them involve, you know, things that seem, might seem to be slight. For example, in uh, James 2, 4, in the uh Nestle 28th edition, there's the addition of, of a conjunction chi, whereas that wasn't in the NA27. 
Um, and at uh, 2 Peter 3.18, in the NA 27th edition, it, in, it ended with the word amen, as it is in the traditional text. But in the 27th edition, they had amen, but it was placed in single brackets. But in the NA 28, at 2 Peter 3.18, the amen is completely removed from the text. And again, um, we believe that the, the traditional text uh, should be uh, upheld. And if it's there uh, in our traditional text, it should not be removed. And indeed, if you look at 2 Peter 3.18 in the Texas Receptus, I've got my uh, TBS edition of the Texas Receptus at 2 Peter 3.18, it ends with amen, but that's taken out now in the Nesolon 28th edition. So some of the changes are, relatively speaking, minor in that they involve a one word or a, a different spelling or, or something like that. Again, those are still, they're not unimportant, even though they're low volume in the number of words or changes. But then there are two changes in that were made in the NA28 that most readers have seen as being quite significant theologically. Uh, the first of those is at 2 Peter uh, chapter 3 and verse 10. And in 2 Peter 3.10, uh, I read it in the authorized version. Um, the, the final uh, line of it is, it's talking about the day of the Lord. Well, just, let me just read all of it, 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And so that's the authorized version based on the, the received text. Now, there was a change made in that last phrase, uh, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. For one thing, in the modern critical text, it doesn't say burned up, but it says uh, shall be exposed. But in the Nesolon 28th edition, the change was there was the addition of the negative particle in Greek, ouk, so that rather than read the earth also and the works therein shall be exposed, uh, in the Nesolon 28th edition, if you were to translate it, it says, and the earth and the works that are therein shall not be exposed. And you see, that addition, that change affects eschatology. What happens at the end of the ages? Is, is the earth and the works that are therein, are they, are they exposed or are they burned up? Or are they not exposed or not burned up? And it's also interesting that they inserted that Greek uh, negative particle, ook, even though that is not found in any extant Greek manuscript. It's only supported by a couple of ancient translations. And so, so though, although the CBGM is based on just um, comparing readings in Greek manuscripts, when they, when, when they did the editing of the NA-28, they decided to include, a, this is called a conjecture, a reading that doesn't have any extant Greek manuscript support. The second major uh, change that was made in the NA 28 was at the book of Jude in Jude 5. Uh, Jude 5 or Jude 1 5 is only one chapter in the book of Jude. It says in Jude 1 5, this is the authorized version based on the traditional text. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. So the traditional reading, which is actually reflected in the NA27, uh, says the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, the Lord referring to the deliverance of the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt. And it uses the term the Lord, kurios. But in the Nesolon 28th edition of 2012, using the CBGM, the reading was changed from Kurios, Lord, to Jesus, Jesus. And so it would read something like, in translation, uh, how that Jesus, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt. And you might say, well, that's, that's good. That means high Christology. Um, Jesus is being referred to as Lord. But that creates a kind of a theological problem because um, the incarnation had not taken place 
at the time of the Exodus, at the time of the historical life of Moses. It's only when uh, uh, Jesus is conceived in the womb of the Virgin, when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, that we can speak of Jesus of Nazareth being in history. Uh, before that, there was the eternal second person of the Godhead, but the incarnation had taken place. And so it, it, it doesn't make theological sense to refer to Jesus having done something in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the, the proper word would be Lord. That would be the, the proper usage. And that was the traditional usage. But now, based on a minority of evidence using CDGM, this has been changed in the modern critical text. And so I mentioned these two in particular because uh, we'll talk about him in just a moment, but there's a, been a certain popular internet apologist who retweeted uh, my tweet and, and said, oh, there's nothing to see here. There's nothing to worry about. There, there are no significant change. This is just spelling variations and so forth. But I think he's on record. Even he is on record as saying he doesn't agree with the change. It was made in the NA28 to 2 Peter 3.10 at least. I don't know what he's weighed in on, on Jude 5. So it would be burying your head in the sand to ignore the fact that changes made to the text will not affect theology. So 2012, NA28, there were 28 changes. Now, Edgar Abojo is telling us that next year, when the NA29 comes out, there are going to be over 200 changes that are going to be made in these longer books, Matthew, Mark, Acts, and Revelation. If you think about um, the, what happened in the NA28 with the Catholic epistles, uh, there were there are 21 chapters in the Catholic epistles. James has five chapters, 1 Peter has five, 2 Peter three, 1 John five, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, just one chapter each. That's 21 chapters. So there were 33 changes made over 21 chapters. When you look at the next books that are going to be incorporated in, in this new edition, uh, Matthew has 28 chapters, Mark 16, Acts 28, Revelation 22. That's a total of 94 chapters. So if there are over 200 uh, changes, 200 plus changes in 94 chapters, that means it's going to average about two textual changes per chapter. And it might be something as slight as the inclusion of a chi, it might be the omission of an amen, it might also be weighty, uh, theologically, theological, uh, theologically impactful, theologically impacting changes that might be made. We don't know. In fact, no one knows. And I heard the popular internet apologist claiming that, oh well, we've already we already know what's in in the the the, the ECM of Acts. We already know it's in the ECM of Mark, but you don't know how they're going to take that material and incorporate it into the handbooks that will be used, again, in Bible colleges, seminaries, will be the basis of um, scholarly work. That will be the basis of translations. We have to wait and see. And so I, I mentioned that. Let me pull my, my tweet up again, if I can, one more time. Yeah, there's my tweet. And um, as I said, uh, a certain popular internet apologist uh, uh, quote tweeted um, my um, tweet. And I just thought, let's look for a second at what he said. This is, of course, James White. Um, and uh, he said, oh, no, the sky is falling. Because I had, again, I had quote tweeted it and I had written there 200 plus changes coming to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. I should have added Revelation. That was a scribal error, but uh, my uh, Twitter is neither inspired nor preserved, uh, providentially preserved. So I should have added Revelation. 200 plus changes coming to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts and Revelation in the next critical text of the Greek New Testament. And I put, um, um, James White was, was making fun of the fact that I had five exclamation marks of course that was meant to be a bit tongue-in-cheek meant to be meant to be cheeky meant to be meant to be funny but also to express alarm hey when you're going to make 200 changes from one edition to another that's significant that's significant tinkering with the text of the new testament anyways um 
he said, of course, what is being referred to is the ongoing work of, on the ECM, which has been years in the making. Mark has been out for a couple of years, as has Acts and the General Epistles. Evidently, COVID really slowed work down, but hopefully, all caps, this means progress is being made in getting the rest of the ECM finished. All this is the application of CBGM to the text. The vast majority of changes, put that in quotes like it's not significant, referred to hardly impact translation at all. And I would think these guys would be happy that at least most of the super minor, super minor changes are toward the Byzantine mainstream. And that is one interesting thing about the CBGM is is it's actually affirmed the validity of some of the so-called Byzantine readings, but not all of them. In some cases, it, it overturns Byzantine readings. So uh, someone here is not being consistent in the way that he interprets uh, the CBGM. It's not all in favor of the, of the, of the Byzantine readings. Uh, and, and what he says then is, which of course differs from their ultimate authority, the TR in many places. In any case, this is the same kind of scaremongering. So apparently, guys, yesterday, I want to confess, I apparently was involved in scaremongering when I retweeted, uh, uh, quote tweeted, or a uh, quote posted, a message from somebody who works for the, for the Wycliffe Bible uh, Translation Ministry about a Bible translation conference that was reporting what was actually said by one of the plenary speakers giving a lecture that there are 200 plus changes. I was scaremongering when I mentioned that. Um, and so, uh, and also, he, of course, he's associating uh, my position wrongly with KJV onlyism. I mean, at some point, don't you think this could be a ninth commandment violation, bearing false witness, if you're saying that I uphold KJV onlyism. KJV onlyism is at odds with uh, Second London Confession, chapter one, paragraph eight, because we believe in the immediate inspiration of the original Hebrew and Greek, uh, and we believe that translations are useful to the degree that they reflect the uh, the inspired and preserved originals. Um, but but anyways, it makes more sense for some people just to dismiss our position by calling it KJV onlyism. Uh, he says, reality is we should be extremely thankful for this work. Yes, people, we should be just gathering around with thanksgiving that the new uh, modern critical edition of the Greek New Testament is about to come out for the massive increase in documentation we have on the New Testament text and the benefit it makes to serious apologetic defense of the faith. TR onlyism is, as we have shown, utterly detrimental to any serious apologetic. And again, of course, we would beg to differ. We would actually say that it is uh, the embrace of the modern critical text that is proven detrimental to real apologetics. Um, who can really stand toe to toe with Muslims and with secularists and defend the inspiration and preservation of the scriptures but someone who holds that those scriptures have been kept pure in all ages, that they are stable, that they're not changing every couple of years. Who really has the more compelling apolo apologetic defense? Whose writings are actually quoted by Muslims? Whose uh, writings are republished by the uh, Ministry of Religion in Iran. They love to quote and they love to even uh, reprint the, the works of modern textual critics because this supports their view that the Bible has been corrupted. But we, on the other hand, are saying that the Bible has been kept pure in all ages. So um, in addition to the quote tweet, uh, a friend of mine emailed me yesterday, James White, included a short segment in yesterday's Dividing Line, his Dividing Line podcast, in which he was uh, criticizing, read my quote, and was criticizing uh, my, um, my reposting this tweet, and again, accusing me of scaremongering, and also trying to 
trying to allay the fears of any out there who might be upset about a think tank in Germany that's about to make 200 plus changes to the uh, modern critical text. You shouldn't be worried about that. Don't be worried about that. Yeah, when they when they made those changes to the general epistles, yeah, 2 Peter 3.10 and Jude 5, they, they, they made those changes that really have huge theological significance, but that probably won't happen with the 200 plus changes that are about to be made or, or with changes that will be made in future editions. You shouldn't worry about that at all. Um, and, and, uh, the friend who sent me the link to the dividing line, and I thought about reviewing it, but then I decided, uh, no, you can listen to it if you want. Um, the friend who sent me the link to it said, Really, it's not worthwhile to engage with James White any longer on this issue. As he put it, quote, he has nothing new, end quote. And in the video, he's rehashing a lot of old things about uh, the ending of Revelation and Erasmus and uh, so forth, in, in many cases, perpetuating uh, anecdotes that don't stand on firm uh, historical footing. And um, sometimes I wonder uh, if people who listen to him regularly ever get tired of hearing the same things repeated. Uh, is there an issue with 200 plus changes that are about to be made in the next scholarly handbooks of the Greek New Testament? Um, yes, there are likely to be passages like 2 Peter 3.10, Jude 5. That will raise questions about, about specific doctrines. But more generally or overall, what uh, this does is it undermines and unsettles uh, the conception of the authority of the Bible, also the stability of the Bible. Uh, it, it, it runs counter to the confessional idea that God has inspired the word, immediately inspired it, and he has kept it pure in all ages. And so it strikes at, it, it's, it's, a, it's a strike against the doctrine of the uh, preservation, the providential preservation of scripture. You know, one of the things I, I challenged uh, James White with when we had our debate, online debate, was can you produce for me one verse in the New Testament that you do not think is subject to change based on either manuscript discoveries or so-called methodological improvements that the academy might suggest for the text. And although he hemmed and hawed and danced around it, he never was able to say there's even one verse in the Bible that isn't might not be subject to later revision or change. We'll see what happens when you do that, as we've said over and over again, is you undercut and you undermine the epistemological foundation of biblical Christianity or Protestantism because our authority is based on scripture alone, uh, sola scriptura, or scripture is the ultimate authority, the guiding authority for faith and practice. Um, I, I sent out a tweet this morning, and I, I I put forward three questions. I said, first of all, um, uh, would you what do you think about um, social trinitarianism? Social trinitarianism was a, a a liberal attempt to reconstrue, redefine the doctrine of the Trinity, and then I uh, postulated a reformed uh, conservative evangelical. Uh, if you if you asked him what do you think about social Trinitarianism? He would say, no way, Back. let's go back to Nicaea. We're not going to accept modern theology. We're going to go back to the classic creedal statements. We're going to affirm Nicene um, um, Trinitarian theology. And then secondly, I said, well, uh, uh, what do you think about, um, or do you trust the science uh, related to the, the um, COVID jabs and then I said, I had that same um, um, reformed um, conservative evangelical. And he says to that, absurd, what do you mean we have to trust the science about this? And then the third question I posed was, well, what do you think about the 200 plus changes 
that are about to be uh, introduced in the critical edition of the Greek New Testament. And then this time, the conservative reformed evangelical says, there's nothing to see here. No worries, hair. Like, let me let me get my updated edition of the ESV. And my point was simply to say that it's inconsistent for conservative reformed evangelicals to say we don't want to accept modern theology and modern liberal attempts to reconstruct the doctrine of the Trinity, and we don't want to accept um, a, a, a government. That, that tells us we must mindlessly accept the so-called science. And, but then they, they have no problems accepting a text that has been reconstructed uh, by the academy. Uh, we have given over stewardship of the Bible to the academy rather than holding fast to the word uh, the word that was the text that was used at the time of the Reformation, the text that was used by the so-called Protestant Orthodox, the text that was translated, the text that was preached, the text that was commented upon, the text that was used as the basis for the Protestant confessions, like the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, the text that was used for the catechisms, Protestant catechisms, teaching things like the doxology of the Lord's Prayer, and all of a sudden, uh, we're going to accept um, we're going to accept an institute in Munster and a collection of scholars, and we're going to let them be the custodians of the text of Scripture, and we're going to let them dictate to us uh, what our text should be and and what should God translations. I think that is an unhealthy and even a dangerous situation for the church today. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Word Magazine, and I hope this sheds some more light on what might be coming down the road uh, with respect to the new scholarly editions, the new handbooks that are about to come out, and the 200 plus changes to the text that are heading our way. Well, again, I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next episode of Word Magazine. Till then, take care and God bless.